Now that the faculty have entered the arena, we'd like to welcome the graduating class of 2022. Students, please commence entering the arena. Thank you and welcome to our eighth graduation. I want to take a moment to welcome everyone and celebrate the fact that we are in person, acknowledging that we will be masked today unless you're speaking at the podium or crossing the stage. I would like to also take a moment to introduce and acknowledge a few people. Donald and Barbara Zucker, after whom the school is named, have been unbelievably steadfast supporters of this medical school. And it was their gift that named the school that allowed us to compete with all of the other schools in this region in terms of offering scholarships to students of need so that we, in fact, could select the best students from our applicant pool, not those that could afford to go to medical school. And so for Don and Barbara, thank you very much. Other important notable guests behind me, Susan Poser, the president of Hofstra University, and Michael Dowling, the CEO of Northwell Health. <laughs> Michael Epstein and Donald Schaefer, co-chairs of the Joint Board of the School of Medicine. And as a group, the leadership of Hofstra University, deans, vice presidents, and deans of the Donald and Barbara Zucker School of Medicine. Also sitting to my right, Richard Goldstein, Marilyn Monta, Ralph Nappi, Mark Claster, all members of the School of Medicine board. And our faculty and the families of all of our students. I would also like to mention some of the honors that are being passed out today that usually are not awarded uh, verbally. Our Grand Marshal was Dr. David Elkowitz, who led the procession in. Faculty, mar <laughs> David is a favorite. 
and our faculty council marshals, Dr. Linda Shore Lesseson and Dr. Joe Clinigliaro. And Joe, I'm very happy to see that my personal physician has such a magnificent outfit that you're wearing today. In addition, we have uh, co-chairs of the faculty, Robert Hill, winner of the first 100 Weeks Teacher of the Year. Rob, where are you? And Dr. Saeed Ahmad, winner of the second 100 Weeks Teacher of the Year. And he led the students' procession in. Lastly, I want to decode all the things the students are wearing, all these medals and cords, because they all signify something important and different achievements. Some are wearing the blue and gold ribbon signaling the Academy of Medical Educators, students wearing a medallion on a blue ribbon signifying their graduating with distinction in research, and a medallion on yellow signifying graduation with distinction in community service. A gold cord signifies the Gold Humanism Honor Society, Green and gold signifies Alpha Omega Alpha, the Medical Honor Society. Blue and gold signifying a departmental award. Black and silver signifying certificates of special proficiency in ultrasound. Blue intertwined with silver for special proficiency in medical Spanish. Black intertwined with gold for the CLAR Leadership Development and Innovation Management recipients. Purple intertwined with gold. This is very complicated. It's, it's in your program, though. Signifies humanities and medicine recipients. And red inter intertwined with gold signifies medical education scholarly recipients. This is in your, in your graduation program as well as other information. We will now begin our 2022 graduation with an invocation delivered by Rabbi David Siegel from the university's Board of Chaplains, followed by the national anthem led by Hofstra University's Kaila Surajbali, class of 2023. Will everyone please rise? Creator of life, as we gather here today to celebrate the achievements of these amazing graduates, we give thanks for bringing them safely to this joyous occasion. Thank you for providing them with the wisdom and endurance to become the agents of change that we desperately need in this world, now more than ever. We know they had help in reaching this special day. Thank you to the families, friends, and administrators for the love and support and understanding that allowed them to reach their goal. As they leave this school and head to the next stage of their journey, please continue to watch over them and remind them that they are never alone. Allow them the insight to recognize the miracles they are witnessing every day and during the difficult times, the ability to continue their holy work. Each night when you return home from a long day, may you always remember that the lives that you have touched and the essential role you play in your communities. May you always have the strength and opportunity to do what you were born for, to help repair our world. Let us say, Amen. Congratulations.
That was definitely impressive. <laughs> and now everyone can take their seats. And it's my privilege to introduce Susan Poser, president of Hofstra University. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Good afternoon and congratulations to the class of 2022. It's a privilege to welcome you and your families and have the opportunity to offer my heartfelt congratulations and wish you well on this day that marks such a milestone in your professional and your personal lives. I hope that you are feeling tremendously proud today. The class of 2022 has succeeded in the face of unique challenges. This medical school class, more than any that preceded it and hopefully that will follow it, has truly run the gauntlet. You spent your entire clinical rotations during a pandemic, healing others while trying to stay safe yourselves and worrying about the safety of your family and friends. You succeeded not only because of your own personal fortitude and humanity, but also because of all you learned during those prior two years at Zucker, where you essentially became clinicians on your very first day as medical students, starting with EMT training and then continuing to interact with patients in the clinic throughout those first two years, an experience that the unique curriculum at Hofstra offers. And here you are on the other side with an outstanding education, a degree in hand, or in a few minutes in hand, and a promising future. I know about this promise because I was present with you and your families on match day at the medical school, and I felt the pride and joy in that room, and I saw where you were all going, and it is so impressive. You are so ready for your future, and the world needs you, and will be so much better for it. And finally, you are now part of the legacy of the Zucker School of Medicine at Hofstra Northwell. And I hope you will come back as you move through your career and share your talents as alumni and mentors to those coming up. We will always be your university and we will always be here for you. So again, congratulations and Godspeed. Thank you, Susan. And now I'd like to introduce Michael Dowling, the President and CEO of Northwell Health. Uh, thank you very, very much, uh, Dr. Smith and Susan Poser. And let me say that on behalf of everybody here and the complete family of Hofstra and the complete family of Northwell Health, I wish to congratulate you all. This is, as you know, a very, very, very special occasion. This will be an occasion that won't fade in your memory quickly. Other events may fade, but not this one. You will always remember the moment you walked in to accept your degree. Because as you know better than anybody, it's the culmination of your dreams, your endeavors, your hopes. And it's the culmination of the dreams and hopes of your family members, all in the back, mothers, fathers, cousins, relatives. Even though I can't tell for sure, but I know they're all beaming with pride. The reason I can't tell is because they're all wearing masks. But I know behind the masks is this wonderful s smile that something special has just occurred. Because as you all know, your success and anybody's success is a result of the efforts of a cast of people, your faculty, the providers in all the facilities that you engaged in across Northwell over the last number of years, especially as Susan Poser mentioned, as uh, two years that were extraordinary. But 
I would say that you would admit that you're all better because of it. You learned more because of it. Your perspective on life has changed because of it. Because you also know that all of us are the result of the tapestry of influence by all those people that we come in contact with throughout our various endeavors, or for that matter, throughout our lives. We don't succeed alone. It's the whole cast. And as you know very well, you're entering a life of extraordinary opportunity. Opportunity to dream, to reimagine, to inspire, to lead. And of course, because of your chosen profession, you have extraordinary responsibility and obligations. People look up to you. People ask for your advice. You have a wonderful obligation and responsibility to cure, to do research, to prevent disease, to treat disease, to help people improve their own health, to deal directly with the inequities in healthcare that you are now so familiar with, to redesign care delivery. Not just to follow the rules as the rules now stand, but to create new rules. To be, as I know Dr. Smith has taught you many, many times, to be a great physician, where patients come first. And as Dr. Smith, I'm sure, has told you that you have the opportunity to redefine the word great. As Dr. Smith is an extraordinary physician, an extraordinary leader, an innovator, a mentor. This school would not be what it is if it wasn't for the leadership of Dr. Smith. He is indeed a special person. So I want to conclude by again congratulating you all and also congratulate all the people on the back because this is your day as well. I want to congratulate all the faculty and, of course, Dr. Smith. And it now gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Ace Levy. He's a graduate of the inaugural class of this school who wants to come and say a few words about Dr. Smith. Again, congratulations and thank you all. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Dr. Asaph Levy. I'm an interventional radiologist at the North Shore <clears throat> University Hospital. And I just want to start off by saying congratulations to you guys. I know it's been a long, long journey, and I'm proud of you, all of you guys sitting here graduating. Um, but when I first walked into the School of Medicine the back in 2011, you know, Dr. Smith was giving us a inspirational talk, as you will. And during that talk, he mentioned the words, don't be afraid to fall in love with medicine. Now, at first, I, didn't, I heard those words, and I didn't really understand the breadth and the depth at which that, that saying actually held. So as you know, Hofstra is all about training unique physicians who care about the patient disease process, but also, more importantly, the patient themselves. Right? So I just wanted to share a story that kind of tied that together for me personally. It was 3 a.m. and I received a phone call from my resident saying that there was a patient that was bleeding. They had a big gastric bleed 
Uh, they are pouring as much transfusions as they could into the patient. They're on three different pressors. There's nothing that anybody else could do. Can we come in and stop the bleeding? So of course I reviewed the images quickly. I got in my car and I'm driving. I'm driving, I'm driving, I'm getting there. Parking, running into the, into the uh, IR suite, I see a, a patient with his wife, you know, in tears. Patient's intubated. Uh, the doctors are shaking their heads. They don't know what's going on. The hemoglobin is four. For those of you who don't know, it should be above eight. Uh, but the patient was not doing well. And so what, what did I do? I went in, I accessed the artery in the groin. I navigated a tiny wire and catheter through the aorta into the vessel that's feeding the upper abdomen. Found the left gastric artery with a tiny microcatheter and injected contrast under fluoro or x-rays. And in those x-rays, when you inject the contrast, it can show you exactly where the blood is going. And I saw what was the biggest bleed I've ever seen. I put this mi small microcatheter into that left gastric artery, and I mixed glue and injected glue to stop the blood flow to that, that pseudoaneurysm or that bleed. So the patient <clears throat> immediately started to respond Blood pressure started stabilizing. Patient was, looked like it, it, we did a good job. So as a Hofstra grad, sure, like, you know, people see that. There's a technical success on the images. It looks great. They high five, whatever. Great, great job. But for us, it goes beyond that, right? I remember that, that patient's wife that was in the, in the waiting room, right? I remember the tears that she was experiencing. So even though you have a technical success, it's important to follow it through to make sure that it's a clinical success, meaning you have to see that patient walk out of the hospital and know that they're okay. So over the next few days, I go up every day and I check on him. He's intubated the next day, gets extubated. He's waking up, he's talking to me. I said, oh, this is the first time I'm hearing his voice. And it was fantastic. The next day, he's getting stepped down to a, a regular unit on the floor. That means he's much better. He doesn't need any pressure support. His blood levels look good. He's not bleeding anymore. So then the next day, and the next day I go back, and his wife one day is with him, holding his hand. I walk into the room. I say, good morning. And they, she looks at me with this big smile and tears welling in her eyes. And she says, thank you so much for saving my husband. I cannot thank you enough. And in that moment, you know, I said, you're welcome. I shook their hands, and it was a pleasure to actually shake his hand as he was putting on his jacket to leave the hospital. But on the way back to the interventional radiology suite in the stairwell, I paused. And I thought to myself, this is actually what Dr. Smith was talking about. I think I fell in love with medicine, because there's nothing that I would rather be doing than to be there in that moment with that patient, with his wife, experiencing that sex, success and joy with them. And I, you know, I urge you guys to continue to remember the patient side of things. Now, Dr. Smith has made a lasting impression on all of us, I'm sure. Um, and that legacy will translate towards not only within these walls of this institution, but throughout all of our actions and how we interact with patients, with families, and how we make a, a mark on the, on the medical, in, in medicine in general, as we go forth with this Hofstra name. So I'd like to congratulate you on getting this honorary degree from the School of Medicine because it's as much your journey as it has been ours. And again, congratulations to you guys and congratulations to Dr. Smith. It is now my pleasure to ask that Trustee Donald M. Schaefer come forward with his candidate for the Doctorate of Humane Letters, Honoris Causa, Dr. Lawrence Smith.
Good afternoon and congratulations to all of you, graduates and families. Today we honor Dr. Lawrence G. Smith, the founding dean of the Donald and Barbara Zucker School of Medicine at Hofstra Northwell, a person of vision, experience, and humanism who led the effort to create this medical skill, school, which opened in 2008. When Northwell Health and Hofstra University combined forces to create a new medical school, the leadership of both institutions knew who would be the right person to lead this effort and make it a reality. A person who had deep understanding of how to educate physicians and scientists, and who had the experience and confidence to put forth a revolutionary approach. That person was Dr. Lawrence Smith. Dr. Lawrence Smith joined Northwell in May 2005 as Chief Academic Officer and Senior Vice President of Academic Affairs, responsible for overseeing Northwell's medical student education programs and academic faculty appointments. He was appointed the inaugural dean of this brand new medical school in 2008 and led a team that built what would become known as the PEARLS curriculum. PEARLS stands for patient-centered explorations in active reasoning, learning, and synthesis. This curriculum values learning as an explorative and reflective experience, allowing students to work in small groups and utilize patient cases to learn the fundamental basic sciences and develop critical thinking skills. In order to introduce students to healthcare in a patient-centered context from day one, the team also built a program called CPR, short for Challenges, Privileges, and Responsibilities. This program required that all first-year medical students become EMTs and work with Northwell emergency response teams on the ambulances. From the moment they walk through the doors of the Zucker School of Medicine, students serve as healthcare providers and medical students simultaneously. This was revolutionary 15 years ago and remains rare at any medical school. In fact, more than 50 schools of medicine around the country have consulted with Zucker's leadership to understand how our curriculum works, and many are beginning to copy it. While serving as the dean of the medical school, Dr. Smith also served as Northwell's chief medical officer and then as physician in chief. Northwell Health senior physician on all clinical issues. Dr. Smith's experience in med medical education predates his tenure with Northwell Health. Dr. Smith was the Mount Sinai School of Medicine, now the Icon School of Medicine, in Manhattan, where he served as dean and chair of the Department of Medical Education, as well as founder and director of the school's Institute for Medical Education. Prior to that, Dr. Smith practiced general medicine at Stony Brook University Hospital, where he was on the faculty and served as director of education and program director of the hospital's residency program in internal medicine. Dr. Smith's leadership positions, awards, and honors are too numerous to mention here. But he is known throughout the country for his approach to education, for his passion for students and for patients, and for his belief in the development of critical thinking and experiential learning. Forever dedicated to his teaching, Dr. Smith is the first recipient of the Lawrence Scheer MD Professor of Medicine at the Donald and Barbara Zucker School of Medicine at Hofstra Northwell. He was honored by Northwell Health Physician Partners as the inaugural recipient of their Lifetime Achievement Award. This award, was endowed in his name to continue to recognize other Northwell Health Physician Partner leaders who embody his commitment to clinical excellence, education, mentorship, and the promotion of diversity, equity, and inclusion. President Poser, for Dr. Lawrence Smith's distinguished career achievements and his groundbreaking vision, his dedication and his leadership in leading the Zucker School of Medicine and its curriculum. It is my honor to present him as candidate for the Doctor of Humane Letters, Honoris Causa. Excuse me. Dr. 
Dr. Lauren Smith, in recognition of your outstanding career accomplishments, your commitment to medicine and medical education, your dedication to the mission and to the students of Hofstra Northwell School of Medicine, and your contributions to and leadership of the Donald and Barbara Zucker School of Medicine at Hofstra Northwell, I am pleased to confer upon you the Doctor of Humane Letters, Honoris Causa. Congratulations. Some of you may have been at the gala the other night when I gave the first small part of this talk, uh, so everybody should relax and get ready. Okay. So first and foremost, we should realize one thing that is true about today's giving me this honorary degree. This honorary degree is a reward and an acknowledgement for all the hundreds of people that made this medical school successful. And those included our students, our faculty, an incredible staff of support people. And so I'd like to make sure they all get a round of applause right now. And as some of you, if you don't know the story, uh, I was working at Northwell, minding my own business, because I, once upon a time, had said to someone, you know, it seems like it would be a good idea if we built a medical school. And everyone went, oh! Mr. Dowling said, never mention a medical school. It's a money pit. I said, okay, no more medical school mentions. But in fact, that was anything but true. So President Stu Rabinowitz and Michael Dowling had an infamous breakfast where the discussion was, should we partner and build a medical school together? And the answer must have been yes, uh, because we're all standing here. And those two men and the people that they had as their senior staff never stopped and paused for one second in supporting me and all of the needs of this medical school. And it is because of, of the unity of the leadership that we were able to build a school different from any other school in the country. But I want to thank the Board of Trustees, the leadership teams of both institutions, uh, the physician partners, where we have literally 400 practices that open their doors every year, year after year, for the initial clinical experience of the first and second year students, the hospitals that open their doors for the advanced clinical teaching, and some other special things. As you know, we do interprofessional education here. And the nursing school and CLI partnered with this medical school thanks to Dr. Kathy Gallo. And I believe, in all honesty, we could not have done it without her. So there are many, many others, obviously the Zuckers, who, who have supported us so amazingly well. At the school, we have assistant and associate deans, the support staff, the student affairs, financial aid, but I want to single out one person who I think exemplifies the culture that made this school so special. And that is a person who's about to retire, Mark Noneman. And Mark, Mark, there you are. So, So Mark is not the professor of security. He is the essence of what the specialness of our school is about. 
Every time I've watched him work, from the first days here, the thing that struck me most was he knew every student by name. And he stopped and smiled at them. And they all stopped to have a tidbit of conversation. Uh, I do it myself. Every time I walk into school, we talk about whatever sports team flopped the night before. Uh, Mark is a very special person, but it isn't that I want to just honor him because of that, but because of he, he exemplified what we asked of everyone who built this school, which was to make it a special, personal, human place where people could have the confidence and the comfort to hang around, to work together, and know they were safe, and know they were special, and know people knew their names. And so, Mark, I want to thank you for that. So I want to tell you a story, because I have lots of time. Uh, <laughs> and it is the story of how does somebody come to the point where you would actually consider saying yes to building a brand new medical school, when no one you knew had even the slightest inkling how you would do that? Well, the fact of the matter was that it started very early. So there's something special about this auditorium, because it sits 1.4 miles from the high school I graduated from in this month in 1967. So I was very close. Uniondale was where I went to high school. And I little, the life comes full circle as I'm standing in front of you. Little did I think as I left high school and, and went off and running uh, that I would be spending so many years building a school so close to where I had those wonderful, exciting, formative years and made so many of my best friends. But I want to tell you a little bit about the personal stuff that happened in my life that led me from where I thought I would go to where I actually went, because I had no intention whatsoever when I graduated high school uh, from, for becoming a doctor. In fact, nobody in my family was a doctor. I rarely saw a doctor. Uh, I didn't like doctors. Uh, <laughs> But the fact of the matter was that I was sitting at graduation with an acceptance and a scholarship to MIT in their School of Electrical Engineering. And I was all set to do that. Uh, I really thought this electrical engineering was really cool, and little did I know, it was right at the beginning of the explosion of the computer era. And undoubtedly, had I gone to MIT, I would have been immersed in that, and that would have been a great and exciting life. But unfortunately, my mother passed away right before graduation from a long battle with breast cancer. And my father asked me not to leave home, that he needed me there. Well, I didn't have any acceptances closer than Boston, and that was obviously too far for him. And so I wasn't quite sure what to do. It was now I'm thinking about this, and it's July. And I'm thinking most schools actually have their class finished. But I was at a Catholic high school, so maybe I should go to a Catholic college and, and twist their arm and plead and beg. And I did that. I actually got my transcripts pirated to me by the lady who liked me in the, in the high school registrar office. And off I went with this non-official transcript to Fordham University, where the woman in admissions just laughed at me and said, you're kidding, right? You're applying to go to school in the year that starts in September? I said, yes but it's, it's only July. And she looked at me, she said, not a chance. I said, well, can I meet with the Dean of Admissions? I said, well, he happens to be here today. Let's see. And he met with me and we had a long talk and I handed him my transcript. And uh, he said, why don't you wait outside? And about 20 minutes later, he came out and said, you're in. I said, okay, that's pretty good. Except they don't have an engineering school. So, so much for electrical engineering, that went down the toilet. Uh, and I said, well, what's the closest thing that I can do that's like engineering? So I decided I would be a physics major, which is what I did for four years. And I liked physics, but I came to a couple of conclusions in physics. As I, as I read about the, the people who changed the world of physics, many of the names you've heard, I decided I wasn't going to change very much in physics. Uh, I just didn't think I was, I was going to be the, the next Albert Einstein. But there was something that had just started 
toward my senior year in college, and that was a new field of biophysics. And this really intrigued me, the application of physics to living organisms and living systems. And there were only a handful of departments of biophysics in the country at the time. And uh, I got myself into Michigan State University, which at the time had the largest department of biophysics. And I was thinking, this is pretty good. Physics in, in biology, new field, I can probably make a dent and really make a big difference. Well, that was for a very short time when suddenly in the lab, we realized we had stumbled on the fact that platinum, eluding from electrodes when you put an electric field across a tank full of bacteria, stopped the bacteria from growing. And the graduate student who was sitting next to me at the next, he was jumping for joy that he had proven that you can't form a spindle in mitosis if there's an electric field because of static electricity. When my, my lead scientist, Barney Rosenberg, said, well, did you do the controls? So he said, what controls? He said, well, don't turn on the electric current. He said, well, that's silly. He said, no, do it. And lo and behold, the bacteria didn't, didn't divide either. And it turns out that from those electrodes, cisplatinum was going into the system. And from that, we went from a biophysics lab, I think, to a pre-cancer clinical trials lab almost overnight. We were hiring veterinarians and biologists, and suddenly there were mice everywhere instead of physics equipment. And everybody realized we had stumbled on a major, major scientific advance. And so I said, you know, this is exciting. And I don't like it. I like it, but it's not what I want to do. What I want to be is the person who's giving that drug to people to make them better. And I had never in my life once even thought of going to medical school. So it was June, and I went and I, I said, I wonder how you get into medical school. It was actually, it was earlier than that, it was April. And so I applied to 100 medical schools, of which 98 of them rejected me immediately because I had none of the pre-work. Pre I had never taken the MCATs because I had never heard of the MCATs. So how, did, how was I to know there was an admission test for medical school? I thought it was pretty easy to get into because all the medical students I had tutored in physics didn't seem very smart. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and so two schools didn't reject me out of hand. Now, I applied to all the low-level schools in the country and worked my way up. And the only two schools that didn't reject me were the University of Michigan and NYU. Everyone else rejected me. All the schools at the bottom of the rankings rejected me in about one millisecond. NYU said, come for an interview. Michigan said, you're only across the state in Michigan State. Uh, could you please take the MCATs? OK. So I took the MCATs. Uh, I was in a biophysics department, so I had done a little biology. And lo and behold, I get a phone call from NYU. You're in. Please send $100 to reserve your spot. This is August 3rd. And if we get your $100, you're going to join the class. So off went our last $100. My wife and I looked at each other. She said, we may not eat for a couple of weeks, but the $100 is off. The next day, Michigan called and said, We'd like you to come for an interview, but we're probably going to offer you a spot. And I said, sorry, you lost that race. My last $100 went to NYU. And in fact, two weeks after I was in medical school, and this is the truth, even though the memory stuff of that first two years I swore I would never, ever do again to any human being, was pretty bad. I loved it. And I've never looked back for a second after those first two weeks of medical school, because it was the first time in my life I knew everything was right. Everything I was studying was what I wanted to do, what I wanted to learn. And I was so excited about that. I did well in school. I did my residency fortuitously at Strong Memorial Hospital in Rochester, which was at the time experimenting in cutting edge new curriculum for residency programs. And I, in fact, enrolled in a residency program that was like no other residency program in the country. It was literally years and years ahead. And from that, I learned how to teach. What was important 
what you really needed to learn to be a doctor, and it wasn't memory. And as you probably know, the, the cell phone has wiped out the need to memorize things, uh, because you can look it up and actually get the, the real answer, as opposed to trusting your memory. But you did have to understand how the human body worked. You did have to see physiology and anatomy when a patient was expressing a complaint and you were examining them. And you did have to conceptualize the problem in ways that allowed you to explore it and make a diagnosis and a correct treatment. And from that was the basis of how I felt the curriculum in medical school should change. It should all be about critical thinking and problem solving and applying knowledge in action to solving patient problems, not to regurgitate back facts on a test. And I hope we came very close to doing that. And so that was really important, and that was the basis. Everything I learned at Strong Memorial Hospital was the reason I said yes when they asked me to be the founding dean of this school. But in the meantime, I spent two years in the Army Medical Corps because they still drafted people uh, and held them to the drafts even though the Vietnam War had been over. Uh, I practiced medicine for a decade at Huntington Hospital as a general internist and critical care doctor. And during that time, I decided I would, I would experiment with all this teaching that I said I was going to get good at. So I volunteered to teach Stony Brook students at the Northport VA. I did it twice a week. And all we did was constantly go to the bedside, elicit the history together, examine the patient, and then they had to put those pieces of the puzzle together to form a hypothesis and then justify it. And we had a great time, absolutely a wonderful time. Uh, and eventually Stony Brook realized I was teaching their students for so long that maybe they should find out who I was. Uh, and uh, they offered me a job in the Department of Medicine. I became the residency director with zero experience, but I was definitely had a lot of experience teaching. And I loved it. And then a man named Barry Kohler who was offered the job of chairman of medicine at Mount Sinai, said, you're coming with me, because I don't want to go to Mount Sinai without you as my vice chairman. And I did. And off we went together. And it was there that I took the next steps up, because I also was the dean of education of the medical school. So I was looking at students from day one of medical school to finishing their residencies and fellowships. And it was an amazing endeavor. And then Michael Dowling seduced me to come to Northwell Health. And he can do that, let me tell you. And the reason was he was looking for someone who could unify the hundreds of residency programs that suddenly Northwell Health was responsible for as they bought and merged with all of these hospitals. And that was an interesting job and I really liked doing it and I became the chief medical officer. But when I was asked to build a new medical school, I knew that was the gift of all times. And that is, has stayed true. And so I got to do this. You guys remember the guiding principles of the medical school? See, your parents probably don't know about these things. So I'll just tell you, we said it's not gonna be like the old medical schools. We're not gonna, we're not gonna memorize things and we're never gonna test memorizing. It's gonna be adult learners. We're gonna integrate physiology, anatomy, basic science, and clinical medicine all the time. We're going to have real patients to learn on, learn with, and we're going to gain enough confidence that we can convince patients to tell us the right story because they trust us. Because all of you should know, you can't be a doctor if patients don't trust you. Cannot, not even for a second. That it's going to be about learning and not teaching. We don't want people performing teaching. We want people making the students learn by teaching. And the person that you guys were cheering for, Dr. Elkowitz, epitomizes that as well as anybody I've ever watched in my life. And from all of that, we built a medical school. And that medical school is doing pretty good. There's over 30 medical schools were started in this country after the year 2000. I call them the post-millennial medical schools, and we are one of them. And of those 30, 32 schools, we are ranked 64 in the U.S. News and World Report. 
and 64 puts us number one of all the schools that were founded after the year 2000. That's pretty good. In addition, we were ranked tied with Columbia College of Physicians and Surgeons as the number one diverse medical school in the state of New York. And I want to point out that that's not bad because they have a 255-year head start on us. And so I come to the point where I have to tell you the one thing that Dr. Barry Cola told me when he hired me at Mount Sinai. He said, nine to ten years, I'm gone, just so you know. So if you're coming to follow me, you're not going to spend the rest of your life working for me because I will leave here within nine to ten years. I said, why? And he said, because we're going to create something because we're inheriting a department that isn't doing well. And by nine or ten years, what we create needs to be blown up and rebuilt. And almost no one can blow up what they built. And so it's really important that leaders change. Because otherwise you begin to believe that you really got it perfect when there is no such thing as perfect. And sure enough, Barry left it nine years couldn't wait for 10. Left me there. That's when I went moved to the dean's office. But I've been here a long time. 2008, I started being the dean, as well as continuing to work at the health system. And it's time for us to reconsider that everything we're doing, there may be a better way to do it. And it isn't an accident that my good friend for the last 25 plus years, Dr. Dave Battinelli, will be exactly the perfect person to do that job. And so whether I hang around to bother him or not, I don't know. But I know that I'm leaving this school in the hands of Dave and the, the leadership team and the faculty that we've brought together who can do anything. And so uh, that's my story. Now, if I had the rest of my notes, I would tell you what I'm doing next. Hold on. Because I know I'm introducing somebody. Who am I introducing? I am introducing Madeline Abrams. <laughs> Madeline is the graduate's choice as their speaker this year, as well as the recipient of the Dean's Recognition Award. Maddie? Thank you for the introduction, Dr. Smith. Good afternoon, everyone. I want to take a brief moment to introduce myself to all of the new faces in the audience today. My name is Maddie Abrams, and I have the tremendous honor of being the student speaker at today's commencement ceremony. In anticipation for the rest of this speech, there is one thing that I believe is very important that you all know about me. I am one of Elton John's biggest fans at least under the age of 50. One of my favorite songs by Elton John is called The Bridge, and it's a little bit less known than his others. I would like to take a moment to share the chorus with you, and don't worry, I won't be singing. The chorus goes like this. Every one of us has to face that day. Do you cross the bridge or do you fade away? And every one of us that ever came to play has to cross the bridge or fade away. In 2007, during our performance at Madison Square Garden, Elton John spoke about the meaning of the bridge. He said, quote, this song is about taking the risk, taking the chance, following your instincts, and not being afraid. This message and his lyrics continued to resonate with me, and today, I would like to share my reflections about the class of 2022 and our bridge. 
But before I speak about our collective journey, I want to first thank those who built the foundation for us. Mr. Dowling, President Poser, and former President Rabinowitz, Dean Smith, and all of the deans, faculty, administration at the Zucker School of Medicine and throughout the Northwell Health System. Without your dedication to medical education and to all of us, we would not be where we are today. You created a place for us to learn, to grow, and to thrive, and you gave us the tools that we will carry with us throughout the rest of our journeys along this bridge. Of course, no bridge can remain standing without its pillars of support. On behalf of all of my peers in the class of 2022, I want to extend the most heartfelt thank you to all of those who have supported us throughout our lives and helped us reach this point. Our parents, grandparents, siblings, partners, friends, cats, dogs, and so many more. And for all those pillars who are, who are no longer here with us, like my grandfather, Dr. Martin Abrams, we know that they are guiding us with uh, the invisible force of legacy and love. My classmates are some of the most incredible individuals that I have ever had the privilege of knowing. And there is no doubt that the friends and family here today have played an important role in shaping each and every one of us. We have all learned from you what it means to be a force of unwavering love and support, and we are all eternally grateful. I also want to tell you a little bit more about the 96 individuals who have taken this journey across the bridge together. Today, my classmates earn the title of Doctor of Medicine, but they are also mothers and fathers, husbands and wives, servicemen and women, children of physicians and first-generation physicians, bikers, hikers, college athletes, bakers and cooks, musicians and dancers, and so much more. Today, we celebrate the obvious accomplishment, our graduation from medical school. But the members of the graduating class of 2022 have so many passions and have achieved so much already. I am so inspired by each and every one of you. In late July of 2018, we all took our first collective step onto this metaphorical bridge when we started our first year of medical school. Initially all strangers, we were soon bonded by our simultaneous fear and excitement for the next four years to come. I remember perfectly our first day of orientation, wandering the streets of New York City, lost in Times Square along with my classmates, trying to figure out our next stop of the day. And I believe that this was our first taste of what we have now known, come to know and love as self-directed learning. And throughout those first few months, we continued to learn together as we tried to figure out which resources to use to study, how to study, how to interpret the key points from a PowerPoint slide with only images and no words, how to write and answer a higher order question, how to memorize drug names and mechanisms only to later learn on rotations that we actually had to know their brand names too, and how to reflect, legitimize, and explore, and then reflect again, and again, and again. And as we continued along our bridge into the preclinical years, we did so as a collective. One aspect of our class for which I am extremely grateful is our collaborative nature and the tight-knit community that we formed early on. From the very beginning, our willingness and desire to learn together was obvious. Within the first month, a Google Drive began circulating around our whole class, filled with communal study guides worked on by many students as well as short cheat sheets and flashcard decks created by an individual or two just willing to share with the rest of us. And of course, I cannot mention our collegiality without discussing our group chat. A 100-person texting thread started on the very first day of school, which to this day, and to the dismay of some of my classmates, is still one of my most active group chats. In writing this speech, I actually scrolled back to the very beginning and read through most of it, and yes, that did take as long as it sounds like it might. Our group chat is filled with information sharing, airing of grievances, jokes and memes to light up a tough day, love and support and endless happy birthday wishes. And although each are small individual messages when you put them together, they read like the diary of the class of 2022 and demonstrates just how close we became. With the support of one another, we reached the last two years of medical school, our clinical years. However, before I get there, it would be remiss of me not to mention the circumstances occurring in the world around us during the time of our transition into these years. On every road we travel, on every bridge we traverse, 
there will always be pit stops where you have to get off, look back at where you came from, and reflect. The end of our second year and beginning of our third year coincided almost exactly with the first peak of COVID-19 in New York City. And while initially we were mainly preoccupied with how this soon to be labeled pandemic was interfering with our final exams and step one scheduling, it quickly became a lot larger than all of us. We are probably the only class that can say that our entire clinical training years as medical students occurred during the peak years of the pandemic. And because of that, I think that we've walked away with invaluable lessons that we will carry with us throughout the rest of our lives. We learned what adaptability and lifelong learning means in medicine. While we spent the first two years being taught medicine that is for the most part already known, we watched firsthand during our second two years as expert physicians and scientists, many of whom are mentors and teachers to us, adapted to the initially limited and then constantly changing scope of knowledge surrounding this virus. We learned what true selflessness looks like, embodied by our extraordinary nurses and staff who spent countless hours sacrificing their own health and safety to minister to sick patient after sick patient after sick patient. We also learned about loss, mortality, and the fragility of life. And while these are not new concepts for physicians and future, future physicians, the pandemic served to reinforce how we approach these topics with the utmost empathy and compassion that our patients and their families deserve. In addition, the COVID-19 pandemic put a spotlight on the vastly inequitable disparities in healthcare delivery and health outcomes in America. And in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, a national outcry arose against racial injustice in response to ever-increasing displays of discrimination and prejudice that results in brutality against members of minority groups. And while these two separate but related features of American society have been long-standing systemic issues too familiar to some here today, unfortunately, this was the first time that many of us started to recognize the depth and the breadth of these issues and how they affect on a daily basis so many in our society. And as a white woman with inherent privilege, I now understand that there is so much that I and many of my peers must continue to learn because the process of self-education does not end with today's graduation. As future physicians, we will be imbued with the responsibility of being considered leaders within our community and societies as a whole, and our voices and opinions will matter. It is important that we use our voices as advocates and as proactive allies to work to instill meaningful change. We will be in the unique position as doctors to amplify suppressed voices, many of whom will be our own patients. Knowing the courage and determination of my classmates, I am confident that we will embrace this responsibility going forward. And so in this greater context, we forged along our bridge into the clinical years. Just as we were becoming comfortable with our preclinical routine, third year presented new personal challenges adjusting to extremely early wake-up times and long hours, balancing studying and clinical duties, learning how to properly ask, is there anything else I can do? In such a way that your resident actually dismisses you instead of giving you more tasks. Realizing that you're, it's way harder than you thought not to be in someone's way in the OR. And overall, just learning how to be a physician. But for every challenge, our clinical years were also some of the most rewarding we were afforded the immense and daunting opportunity of caring for real people, real patients. While we often referred to ourselves as just the medical students, to many of our patients, I think that we were more than we gave ourselves credit for. We were the ones who walked in every morning with more time to spend with our patients than most providers could. And we were the ones with an eagerness for knowledge and an appreciation of the honor of learning through our patients. We experienced directly for the first time how the relationship between provider and patient is a unique and incomparable bond. The next time that we see a patient after today, we will be suddenly confronted with an even higher level of duty. We're going to be their doctor. This title is an honor that we must never take for granted, but knowing my classmates, I know that we never will. We will be committed to our patients with empathy and compassion because that is how we have been trained here. At this point, I want to take an opportunity to honor Dean Smith. As most know, Dr. Smith is retiring from this position after this year, and thus this will be his last commencement ceremony. Of course, there is no way in this address 
to adequately praise Dr. Smith for what he has accomplished and means to our medical school as founding leader and sure-handed guide of the Zucker School of Medicine for the past 11 years. So if I might just say this, on behalf of the graduating class of 2022, the seven classes that have preceded us, and for all those future classes our medical schools will send out into the community, we owe you a debt of gratitude that cannot be repaid. But we will do the best we can to make good on your vision by bringing the best health care we can to the uncountable patients that we care for. And that way, thousands upon thousands of people across the years will be touched by your efforts, your relentless energy, and your determination to make the Zucker School of Medicine a world-class medical school. Now we are ready to take our first step onto this bridge as doctors. And as we take this step, I will keep in mind, and I hope you will too, Elton John's words that encourage us to never be afraid to follow our dreams. Every one of us has to face that day, do you cross the bridge or do you fade away? And every one of us that ever came to play has to cross the bridge or fade away. Our experiences will vary depending on many factors, like our specialty, where we live, and the vagaries of life but I think that we will all share important experiences. The responsibility to our patients, the excitement of learning medicine and the emergence of new medical knowledge and advances, and the privilege of teaching and guiding younger students. Of course, we will have some significant lows as well, but even these are shared experiences as physicians, and I hope that we can find solace and strength in one another as we go through it together. We are going to have vast challenges as medicine in America changes, and as we continue to attempt to make a difference in the inequities in healthcare that we have all seen too much recently. But for all of this and more, we are ready. And when we look back over the years and across the expanse of the bridge we have traversed, we will see glowing on the horizon the Zucker School of Medicine and all that it gave us to guide us on our journeys. And it will remind each of us that we crossed the bridge that we came to play and that we did not fade away. Thank you all for being here today and congratulations to the class of 2022. President Poza, I have the honor now to present to you the students who have satisfied all the requirements for the degree Doctor of Philosophy in the Donald and Barbara Zucker School of Medicine at Hofstra Northwell. And I am pleased to join with the faculty in recommending that you confer the degree Doctor of Philosophy upon these candidates. Graduates, by virtue of the authority vested in me by the trustees of Hofstra University and by the Regents of the State of New York, and upon the recommendation of the provost, Dean Smith, and the faculty of the medical school, I am delighted to confer upon you the degree of Doctor of Philosophy. Congratulations. And now Dr. Betty Diamond, Program Director of the PhD and MD-PhD programs, and recently elected as a member of the National Academy of Sciences, will now announce the graduates. Please join us on the podium with your PI and hood when your name is called. Betty? Ryan J. Ashley, who wrote his thesis on the characterization and modulation of human erythroid progenitors in normal and disordered erythropoiesis in the laboratory of Leo Blanc. And I'll be putting you
Ashley Nicole Barlev, who wrote her thesis on plasma cell activation and systemic lupus erythematosus in my laboratory. Elena Catherine Brindley, who wrote her thesis on RASA-3 regulates stage-specific cell cycle progression in murine erythropoiesis with Leo Blanc. Mustafa H. Ghanem, who wrote his thesis on molecular dissection of a novel lupus risk locus with Peter Gregerson, and he'll be hooded by Peter. Tomas S. Huerta Novoa, who wrote his thesis on vagus nerve contributions to metabolic health and immune sensing with Kevin Tracy, and he'll be hooded by Kevin. Tiani Liu, who wrote his thesis on rage in layer one and systemic lupus erythematosus in my laboratory. <laughs> Eric Michael Sturgill, who wrote his thesis on reactive oxygen species in chronic lymphocytic leukemia, metabolic determinants of cell fate and function in the laboratory of Nick Chirazi, and he'll be hooded by Nick. <laughs> so congratulations to all of you, and we'll now recite together the Oath of the Scientists, and will all of the PhDs and all of the MD graduates with distinction in research and all researchers rise and recite this together. And the oath is in your program. So I'll give you a few seconds to find it, and then we'll recite it together. By accepting my Doctor of Philosophy degree, I earnestly assert that I will apply my scientific skills and principles to benefit society. I will continue to practice and support a scientific process that is based on logic, intellectual rigor, personal integrity, and an uncompromising respect for truth. I will treat my colleagues' work with respect and objectivity and be a collaborator within the scientific community sharing knowledge and resources resulting from my research. I will teach these scientific principles to my students. I will seek to increase public understanding of the principles of science, and we know how important that is, and its humanitarian goals. These things I do promise. Congratulations.
President Poser, I have the honor now to present to you those students who have satisfied all the requirements for the degree Doctor of Medicine in the Donald and Barbara Zucker School of Medicine at Hofstra Northwell. And I am pleased to join with the faculty in recommending that you confer the degree Doctor of Medicine upon these candidates. Graduates, by virtue of the authority vested in me by the trustees of Hofstra and by the Regents of the State of New York and upon the recommendation of Dean Smith and the faculty of the medical school, I am delighted to confer upon you your degree, Doctor of Medicine. Congratulations. We ask that each of the graduates come to the stage to be introduced by Dr. Ellen Perlman, and no hugging. <laughs> Associate Dean for Professionalism and Doctoring Skills, hooded by Dr. David Battinelli, Vice Dean, or a family member with the same degree, and be recognized by President Susan Poser and Michael Dowling. Graduates, please join us as your name is called on the podium. Madeline Elizabeth Abrams. Degree conferred with distinction in research, recipient of the Dean's Recognition Award, and recipient of the Department of Cardiology Graduate Award. Bilal Ahmed. Ryan J. Ashley, receiving both his MD and his PhD. <laughs> Ashley Nicole Barlev receiving both her MD and PhD degrees, recipient of the Dr. Vincent Vinciguerra and Dr. Jonathan Kolitz Award in Pathology and Laboratory Medicine and Medical Research. She is being hooded by her father, Dan Barlev, and her sister, Renee Barlev. Elizabeth Grace Beals. Brandon A. Blank. Degree conferred with distinction in research. <laughs> William E. Borenzweig. Sharon C. Bossert, recipient of the Department of Neurosurgery Graduate Award. Sonam Brambat.
Elena Catherine Brindley, receiving both her MD and PhD degrees. Kishan G. Bolsara, being hooded by his father, Girish Bolsara. Aaron L. Burstein, degree conferred with distinction in research. Joshua G. Burstein, degree conferred with distinction in research. Leah Marie Carroll. <laughs> Being hooded by her father, Stephen Carroll. Daniel Howell Cheng. <laughs> Gregory R. Kiankyo. Yuna Choi. <laughs> Christopher Chung. Barbara N. Cortez. <laughs> William Matthew de Govea. Recipient of the Department of Orthopedic Surgery Graduate Award. Justin Noah Diamond. Being hooded by his mother, Leora Lanskowski, and his, his father, Alan Diamond, and his grandfather, Philip Lanskowski. <laughs> <laughs> 
Eric C. Dolmovitz. Clinton C. Ahedem. Congratulations. Vivian. In Kiru and Mengo. <laughs> Julia G. Applebaum. Recipient of the Department of Psychiatry Graduate Award. Yes. Danielle Teresa Fissen. Rachel L. Ferruya, degree conferred with distinction in community engagement and recipient of the Student Leadership Award. Alan Gao. Stephanie Elizabeth Garcia. Yes, Sri Lakshmi A. Garakapati. Mustafa H. Vanam, receiving both his MD and his PhD degrees, being hooded by his father, Hadi Ahmed, and his son. Gregory M. Giancana. Yeah. Christian Giganti.
Vasiliki Gliagias. Degree conferred with distinction in research. Aaron J. Goldstein. Liat Seema Goldstein. Being hooded by her spouse, Adam Goldstein, Hofstra alum, her brother, Eitan Weinstock, and her two daughters, Isla, Ayla, sorry, and Cora. Sebastian Gutierrez de Pineras. <laughs> Julie Ann Hemphill. Matthew B. Hill. <laughs> Catherine E. Ho. Being hooded by her father, Dominic Ho. Benjamin Eric Hoffman. Yeah, Elise Grace Hahn. Being hooded by her father, Man Han, and her sister, Emily Han. <laughs> Tiana Autumn Hudson German. being hooded by her mother, Juliet Hudson. <laughs> Jessica Marie Hyla. Recipient of the Department of Family Medicine Graduate Award. And with us remotely, but sadly not in person, is Ginny Jeng.
And also with us remotely, and unfortunately not in person, is Ashna Joseph. <laughs> Hannah S. Jewel. <laughs> Degree conferred with distinction in community engagement, Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology Graduate Award. Amitha Kapoor. <laughs> Sabrina Khan. Recipient of the Department of Science Education Graduate Award. Daniel S. Kim. Being accompanied by his two lovely daughters. <laughs> Nancy Kim. <laughs> Degree conferred with distinction in research. <laughs> Emily Nalvin Krasnow. <laughs> Being hooded by her parents, Lisa Nalvin and Joel Krasnow. Corey Ross Lasher. Being hooded by his brother, Gregory Lasher. Jake Ross Lehman. <laughs> Peter Thomas Leistikoff. Recipient of the Department of Neurology Graduate Award. Maribel C. Lima. William G. Lycus III. Degree conferred with distinction in research, being hooded by his father, William G. Lycus Jr. Angela Leo. Degree conferred with distinction in research. Tiani Liu. 
receiving both his MD and PhD degrees. Brandon Scott Lynn. Nicholas M. Malchion. Anthony Thomas Marciano. Recipient of the Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation Graduate Award. Sean J. Matuzak. Recipient of the Department of Radiology Graduate Award. Lydie K. McKenzie. Dina Sophia Moomin. Theomi Wynn. Adam Opitz Lewy, recipient of the Department of Anesthesia Graduate Award. Pablo Xavier Palacios, degree conferred with distinction in research, being hooded by his grandfather. Pedro Palacios. And unfortunately couldn't be with us here today, but is uh, here remotely and on the eve of a wedding, uh, Christopher David Peterson. He is the recipient of the Department of Surgery Graduate Award. Philippe Z. Rameau. Oh, no! <laughs> Degree conferred with distinction in community engagement. Crystal Jamil Robinson, recipient of the Branson Sparks Humanism Award. Charles G. Wrong.
Jonathan M. Shackney. Being hooded by his father, Jeffrey Shackney. Ilan G. Shahabani. Shaya Shasavarani. Michael Shen. Matthew Michael Ciano. Eric Michael Sturgill. He's receiving both his MD and PhD degrees and being hooded by his mother, Christine Sturkel. Alexandra Serge. Recipient of the Department of Pediatrics Graduate Award. Aaron Tabibzada, recipient of the Department of Medicine Graduate Award, being hooded by his mother, Merjan Tabibzada. Dylan Tan. Rachel Jesse Tannenbaum. Degree conferred with distinction and research. Recipient of the Department of Dermatology Graduate Award. Victoria L. Timmel. Joby J. Tsai, degree conferred with distinction in research, being hooded by her mother, Nancy Tsai. Roland S. Vaca, Jr., recipient of the Michael G. Gutenberg MD Award in Emergency Medicine. Sarah C. Vander Elst. Recipient of the Department of Otolaryngology Graduate Award. Yeah. 
Sorab K. Vatsia. Being hooded by our very own Shido Vatsia. And unfortunately couldn't be with us today, but here remotely, Maria Elizabeth Vincent. Nathaniel H. Webb. Amanda M. Wong. Degree conferred with distinction in research, being hooded by her sister, Kimberly Sue. Angela Yang. Matanya Yehonatan. <laughs> Esther J. Yi. Victoria Zhao, being hooded by her mother, Rong Su. Daniel Zhu. Degree conferred with distinction in research, recipient of the Department of Ophthalmology Graduate Award, being hooded by his father, Andy Zhu. And last but not least, Harrison L. Zucker. Congratulations, graduates. But please take a moment to acknowledge your families and loved ones who joined us today with this celebration. And I now ask Dr. David Battinelli to step forward and lead you in the oath. Can I have all the physicians and new physicians in the audience follow along and please read with me. I swear to fulfill to the best of my ability and judgment this covenant. I will respect the hard-won scientific gains of those physicians in whose steps I walk and gladly share such knowledge as is mine with those who are to follow. I will apply for the benefit of the sick all measures that are required avoiding those twin traps of overtreatment and therapeutic nihilism. I will remember that there is art to medicine as well as science, and that warmth, sympathy, and understanding may outweigh the surgeon's knife or the chemist's drug. 
I will not be ashamed to say I know not, nor will I fail to call in my colleagues when the skills of another are needed for a patient's recovery. I will respect the privacy of my patients, for their problems are not disclosed to me that the world may know. Most especially must I tread with care in matters of life and death, and never abuse the power that has been bestowed upon me. I will remember that I do not treat a fever chart, a cancerous growth, but a sick human being whose illness may affect not only the person, but a family and community. I will prevent disease whenever I can, for prevention is preferable to cure. I will remember that I remain a member of society with special obligations to all my fellow human beings, those sound of mind and body, as well as the infirm. I will maintain the health of my own mind, body, and spirit, so I am able to discharge my duties appropriately. I do not violate this oath. May I enjoy life and art, respected while I live, and remembered with affection thereafter. May I always act so as to preserve the finest traditions of my calling, and may I long experience the joy of healing those who seek my help. Congratulations. So just a few concluding uh, tasks to be done. So first of all, since uh, I am your dean and my family is sitting over here, I want to introduce you to my family. So let's start with my twin granddaughters, Courtney and Anya. Wave to the people. <laughs> and my son, Chris, and daughter-in-law, Anne Marie, two superb physicians. And my partner in life, Bella, wave to the people. Now, you may wonder why the poor guy sitting at the end with that great suit on, I left till last. But the fact is that when we were starting the medical school, we had an organizing meeting to recruit faculty. And it was held in the faculty club, and it was packed. And on that day, there was a six-week-old baby in a carriage sitting, you know, lying, and that was my grandson, Gavin. So the day we started the planning of the medical school, Gavin was six weeks old, and he's now moving into middle school next. Gavin, congratulations. <laughs> and now I want to leave you with one thought, and the thought is, don't lose what got you here. Remember why you wanted to become a doctor every day of your life. And I'll give you a clue. It's always all about the patients. So there's a poem that I really like by William Stafford. William Stafford was the poet laureate of the United States. He wrote poems over almost 60 years. And he wrote a poem every morning, or a piece of a poem. And this poem was written 26 days before he died. He actually wrote a poem on the day he died. But I like this poem very much, and it's called The Way It Is. So just listen carefully, because it is poetry. There's a thread you follow. It goes among the things that change, but it doesn't change. People wonder about what you are pursuing. You have to explain about the thread, but it is hard for others to see. While you hold it, you can't get lost. Tragedies happen. People get hurt or die, and you suffer and get old. Nothing you can do can stop times unfolding, but you don't ever let go of the thread. I wish you that, and thank you very much. And so our final is I invite you, everyone in this auditorium, to the celebration at the School of Medicine. I ask that the audience remain in place until the academic procession and the stage party leave. And thank you very much, and congratulations.